We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Earlier today, killer Robbie McIntosh was sentenced for the attempted murder of Linda MacDonald in Dundee, a crime committed while he was on home leave awaiting parole. Does the First Minister agree with me that this appalling case raises further questions about our justice system and why killers who should be in jail are instead allowed to walk free before our parole board has even ruled that they are safe to do so? First Minister. Well, Ruth Davison raises a very important issue. Uh, the case uh, that she raises today is extremely distressing and, and my thoughts, I'm sure the thoughts of all of us, are with the victim of what was a horrific attack. Uh, obviously, I cannot comment directly on the decision the court has taken on sentencing. However, I can confirm in factual terms what the sentence handed down today means. Uh, Robbie McIntosh has today been given an order for lifelong restriction. Uh, that means he will not be considered for release until he has served the punishment part of his sentence. Uh, after that, consideration of release would be a matter for the Parole Board for Scotland. Any decision would be made on the basis of the need to protect the public. But if Robbie McIntosh were to be released at any point in the future, he will be subject to intensive supervision for the rest of his life. In terms of uh, the issue of home leave, uh, as Ruth Davidson will be aware, uh, a system of home leave has existed for life sentence prisoners for many, many years. Uh, it is a well-established part of the rehabilitation process. A rigorous risk assessment is undertaken by the Scottish Prison Centres before any offender is granted any form of unescorted uh, leave that involves psychological assessment, social work reports and reports on the time they've spent in prison. Home leave is also always granted with very strict conditions applied. In terms of its application to this case, which I understand uh, raises concerns, the Scottish Prison Service uh, has undertaken an incident review that has considered all stages of the individual's progression in the prison system. It has also reviewed the risk assessments undertaken uh, to make sure that any lessons uh, from this case are learned. That report has been shared with the MAPA Strategic Oversight Group in Tayside, who initiated a significant case review, and that will consider the circumstances of the case and identify where any improvements needed uh, can and will be made. So I fully understand uh, that the circumstances of uh, this case raise these concerns. Uh, however, I hope that uh, the information I've shared with the Chamber today uh, will be of some reassurance, not just to members, but to the wider public. Ruth Davidson. I thank the First Minister for her response, and she's right to say that it's rare that we raise individual criminal cases in this Chamber, but this example merits it. McIntosh had been out just five days before he tried to kill again. And as his victim's husband, Matthew, said, given his past conviction for a brutal murder, I can't believe the Scottish Prison Service deemed that this sick individual who attempted to murder my wife was allowed to be in the public domain. The family say that it's not enough for the Scottish Prison Service and the Parole Board to just look at what went wrong in this case, such as the instant review the First Minister mentions. Relatives say they must re-examine their criteria for both assessment and release of all such criminals on home leave. Does the First Minister agree with me that this must now take place? First Minister. Uh, absolutely, I agree. And as I uh, indicated in my previous answer, uh, any lessons uh, that require to be learned in association with this case, of course, uh, require to be applied for the future as well um, and, and that is absolutely the case and so therefore on that specific point um, I, I do agree with Ruth Davis and can I also say I entirely understand and sympathise with the views of the family. I think if I was in the shoes of uh, the family members of, of this victim I would be saying exactly the same things. I think all of us can uh, recognise that. I, I don't think and I assume uh, if, if I'm getting this wrong no doubt Ruth Davidson will, will tell me but I'm assuming Ruth Davidson is not arguing that there shouldn't be provision in our criminal justice system for home leave. Uh, as I said earlier on, it has for a long time been an established part of the rehabilitation process. However, it is right that the most rigorous of risk assessments are undertaken by the, the prison service, and it's the prison service as opposed to the parole board who decide on matters uh, of home uh, leave. Uh, and it's also important that strict conditions are applied. The, the kind of con restrictions uh, that are uh, often applied are uh, restricting where a prisoner can visit, stipulations on what time they must be at their uh, residence, for example. So if there are lessons to be learned from this case, and undoubtedly uh, I think there will be, then of course those lessons must be applied for the future. Ruth Davis. I accept that this is an extreme case, but it does tap into a wider public concern. 
Under current rules, criminals can be allowed out of jail before their official release. And as the First Minister says, it's called temporary release. And that means that they can be let out into the community without supervision. Now, through freedom of information, we've discovered that there were over 4,000 cases in the last year alone where, like McIntosh, prisoners had been granted such leave. Now, there is, of course, a small fraction of cases like compassionate leave where this may be appropriate. But does the First Minister agree with me that when 4,000 convicted criminals are walking out of prison before they've even been considered for parole, that this is something that we perhaps should look at again? First Minister. I think we should look at whether there are lessons to be learned from a case like this one to change or tighten uh, the way in which risk assessments are, are, are carried out in future. So I absolutely agree with that. In principle, though, and yeah, I accept these can be difficult discussions to have and these can be uh, difficult things, I think, for, for the public, not just for those of us who are members of this parliament. But home leave has been an important part of, of the rehabilitation and the reintegration process for a long time. It, it in part allows an individual to be tested on how and if they can adapt to living in the community. For life sentence prisoners, home leave is the final stage in a phase programme of increasing their freedoms. And often it helps to inform the parole board's decisions on suitability uh, for release. Home leave will only be granted after the prisoner has progressed successfully through the prison system. So I think, in principle, it is important to have a system like this. But as I've also said, we must learn lessons from individual cases, albeit that they are extreme cases, to make sure that there is a continuous uh, system of learning in place. So I'm absolutely committed, as I know the Scottish Prison uh, Service will be, to making sure that any appropriate lessons are learned. Ruth Davison. I don't think it's unreasonable for the public to expect prisoners to serve their time. When cases like today's emerge, the question from the public is why again? Why is a killer let loose to try and kill again? Why are the dice loaded against victims and in favour of criminals again? Why do we only act when another family is left to pick up the pieces of their lives again? Home leave for convicted murderers where they are free to walk the streets before they even face the parole board should be reviewed. Isn't it that simple? Um, no, I don't. With, with the greatest of respect to Ruth Davidson, I don't think these issues are that simple. I mean, Ruth Davidson says that the public have a right to expect that prisoners serve their time, and in principle, I agree with that. In fact, it's this government, of course, who uh, finally took the steps to restrict automatic early release of prisoners. But where prisoners are to be released, we owe it to the public to make sure that appropriate steps have been taken to reintegrate those prisoners into society because it's the steps that are taken to do that that reduces the risks of prisoners re-offending. The worst thing I think the prison service and the parole board uh, could do in terms of wider public safety is to have a, a prisoner uh, that is simply released on the last day of their sentence without any steps have been taken uh, gradually and over a period of time to rehabilitate and reintegrate them. That's why a system of home leave, however difficult this can sometimes be to discuss and debate, is really important as a part of a criminal uh, justice system. Um, I think at the heart of Ruth Davidson's question, as is often the case for, for the Conservatives, although often their actions in government don't quite match the rhetoric in opposition, is, is this notion that somehow Scotland's justice system is, is soft touch. That frankly, the facts do not bear that out. We've got one of the highest prison populations in the whole of Europe. And the big challenges for our criminal justice system uh, of course, uh, serious uh, criminals should be locked up, that's not in doubt. But the bigger challenge for our uh, criminal justice system is how we do rehabilitate where appropriate prisoners so that there is less of a risk of them reoffending. So these, with the greatest of respect to Ruth Davidson, are not simple issues. These are actually really complex issues. And we actually have a duty uh, to recognise the complexity with the public. Uh, but that, of course, doesn't take away from the fact that when something goes wrong in a case, as will always happen, unfortunately, in any system, we make sure uh, that the views of the family, of course, are listened to and that lessons are learned. And that's exactly the, the process that will be followed in this situation. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister's own poverty advisor, Naomi Eisenstadt, has said that investment in good quality and affordable early learning and childcare is crucial. Crucial because of the difference that it can make to children from poorer backgrounds. 
So it was a matter of grave concern to read Audit Scotland's latest report criticising the government's progress in expanding early learning and childcare provision last week. They say there is no national leadership, no sense of urgency, and a £160 million funding gap. How does the First Minister answer that damning criticism? First, well, first of all, let me, let me just share with the Chamber uh, the very first paragraph of the Audit Scotland report that was published last week, and I'm quoting, uh, the Scottish Government's policy to increase funded early learning in childcare is consistent with national strategic objectives around improving the lives of children and their families. The Scottish Government and councils uh, have worked well together to expand provision and parents are positive about benefits. Uh, we have, of course, already expanded early learning in childcare from the situation inherited from the last Labour uh, Liberal administration and the plans that we are pursuing now are the most ambitious plans to extend childcare and early learning that this parliament has ever seen. Now inherent in ambitious plans there will be challenges uh, but we are working through those challenges. We are on track to deliver this expansion. We're discussing with councils uh, a multi-year funding package. It's not unusual with policies like this for initially there to be disagreements between local and national government about the amount of money required. We uh, fully plan to have agreement with COSLA uh, by the end of April on this. And let's not forget the purpose of this policy. It is to improve the experience in the early years uh, of our youngest children to prepare them better uh, for their school years and beyond. And of course it is also about uh, helping parents it work without massive childcare costs. So this is the right policy. Yes, delivering a policy of this scale has challenges, but we are determined, as we were with the 600 hours expansion, to deliver this because it's in the interest of young people, the length and breadth of this country. Richard Leonard. Yeah, but you see it's there in paragraph 66 of Audit Scotland's report, and I quote them, the Scottish government has not led has not led a national approach to help the expansion in funded hours. But, presiding officer, it's not just the depth, but the breadth of the problems in this government's early learning and childcare policy that are a cause for concern. Audit Scotland also reports that the government, and I quote them again, has not yet done enough to ensure that the 12,000 additional staff needed to deliver this new entitlement will be in place on time. So, First Minister, where is your plan to find the additional 12,000 nursery workers needed to meet your childcare promise? First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of the overall policy, I, I remember when, uh, to be fair, not Richard Leonard, because he wasn't a member of the Parliament at the time, but I remember other uh, members of Labour benches telling us that we wouldn't deliver the 600 hours that we committed to. We've delivered that, showing the track record in delivering expanded childcare, and we are on track to deliver uh, the next expansion, and we'll do that. In terms of the workforce, because Richard Leonard uh, says, where's the plan, which actually is a question that could be asked about every aspect of Scottish <laughs> Labour's policy, but we'll leave that to one side. Uh, where's the plan? Let me outline uh, the workforce plan. Uh, firstly, the national recruitment campaign launched in October last year. We're developing phase two for summer this year, which is focused on career changers. Uh, we've already increased capacity in early years courses in colleges and universities to support the first phase of the workforce expansion. Uh, the Scottish Funding Council is offering uh, around 1,500 additional places on a one-year HNC course in 2018-19, uh, 400 additional graduate level places. Uh, we're funding 435 additional graduates to work in nurseries in our most deprived areas and island councils by August this year. Skills Development Scotland has committed to increasing the number of modern apprenticeships in early years uh, and childcare by 10%. When, when, when Labour are actually getting the detailed yeah. answer to their question, you notice yeah. they don't actually want to hear it. So let me let me go back. Always wrong. Let me go back to the answer. Nice Skills to Development you. Scotland is increasing the number of modern apprenticeships in early years in childcare by 10% year on year up to 2020. And of course, 
We're also enabling payment of the living wage to all childcare staff delivering that funded entitlement. So, uh, to Richard Leonard, let me say quite clearly, there's the plan. <laughs> Richard Leonard. Well, in, am in amongst that avalanche of statistics, the First Minister... <laughs> The First Minister did not even address the huge shortfall in capital funding. Councils need Order, almost please. £750 million to buy land, adapt and build all of the premises needed to deliver this policy, but the money is not there for that either. This Government rightly made childcare its flagship policy, but as it stands, there is not enough money, not enough staff, not enough buildings to keep that promise. And Scotland's parents can't even access their existing rights. One parent has told the campaign group Fair Funding for Our Kids, and I quote them, it costs so much to have the kids looked after while I'm working, it's not worth working. Another said, when I had my second child, it was cheaper for me to be at home than at work. So this policy might well fit on an election leaflet, but First Minister, your delivery of it is not fit for purpose. No one can believe your childcare promises for the future because your policies in the present are failing. Absolutely. Local councils say it, parents say it, Audit Scotland says it. When will you start to listen? First Minister. Uh, firstly, let me, let me apologise to Richard Leonard for clearly providing more facts in my last answer than he could cope with and given him more of a plan than he actually wanted. Unfortunately, I'm going to do the same all over uh, again. You know, in terms of our past commitments, we have delivered the 600 hours that we committed to delivering. Uh, we also see flexibility uh, increasing. So we see the proportion of council uh, settings providing uh, funded care before, during and after school has increased. The proportion of council settings operating during school holidays has increased. But of course, it's to increase flexibility further that we are going from 600 hours a year right now to uh, the 1140 that we are committed to. In terms of funding, this is funding that will be delivered over a number of years up to 2020. So in this year, we're providing 76 million in revenue funding to local authorities, uh, sorry, in the year about to start. Of that, £52 million is new. We're also providing, Richard Leonard talked about building the premises. We're providing in 2018 19, £150 million in capital funding specifically to support the next phase of infrastructure investment. And I have to say, finally, presiding officer, it is a bit rich for Richard Leonard to come here today and complain about the funding for this policy when that funding for the coming financial year that I have just outlined, Richard Leonard and all of his colleagues voted against in this chamber yesterday. We have a... Thank you. There's a number of constituency supplementaries. The first from Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Recent figures revealed by the Press and Journal showed that my region, the North East, had the highest number of school pupils caught with knives. First Minister, I have here a letter from December 2017 from the Justice Minister in which he promised me that he would publish statistics on school exclusions for carrying a weapon in January 2018. As at today's date, the statistics have not been published. Why not? First Minister. Well, I'll ask the Justice Secretary to write to the member to update him, but we are, we've had exchanges on this issue before. I've had exchanges with Ruth Davidson on this before. Uh, we are now uh, publishing more statistics around the carrying of weapons in schools. The Police Scotland statistics that are published uh, now uh, distinguish uh, between different categories, and I think that is right and proper, of course. Uh, equally importantly uh, as publishing the data, which is important, we have uh, a number of programmes of work, uh, many of them funded by this government, to reduce violence uh, on the part of young people, not just in our schools and generally. So this is important work. Uh, I'll ask the Justice Secretary to give him a specific update on the point he raises, but I think this is something that uh, members across the chamber uh, will be united in committing to doing as much as we can to tackle and to challenge. Lee MacArthur. 
Thank you, President Officer. Under the contract signed between the Scottish Government and Circle Northlink, Orkney's lifeline ferry service across the Pentland Firth has been provided by a freight vessel over recent weeks. Does she believe that is acceptable? And if not, can she explain what steps her government took to ensure a more appropriate replacement vessel was identified? And could she also apologise to those who have been unable to travel on this route during the refit period, including my constituent Terry Jane White, a UHI student rep with fibromyalgia, who asked the very legitimate question, how a replacement ferry in 2018 is not accessible for wheelchair users? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I obviously, I don't know the details uh, other than uh, what Liam MacArthur has just shared with me about his particular constituency case, but of course, um, it is deeply regrettable if any uh, person, particularly somebody with a disability, felt that they didn't have the standards uh, on a transport system that they have a right to expect. Obviously, we w want and expect the highest uh, standards, uh, whether on Northlink ferries or any other part of our transport system. In terms of the specific issues about uh, the vessel being used during a period of refit for the normal vessel, um, of course, there will be a number of issues that CERCO have had to uh, consider there. I'm more than happy to ask the transport Minister to speak further with CERCO on this particular point and communicate directly uh, with the member on the detail of it. And Jenny Mara. Presiding Officer, Channel 4 News led with a heartbreaking report from Dundee this week. Our city suffered 12 drug deaths in January alone compared to 38 in the whole of 2016. Dundee has the highest drugs death rate in Scotland. Scotland's rate is far above the UK average and the UK's drug death rate far exceeds the European average. This is a human crisis deep in the heart of our communities. What can the First Minister's government do to help reduce drug deaths in Dundee and across the country? First Minister. Well, this is a, a really important issue, and I think uh, everybody would be distressed at any drug death and obviously distressed at the contents of the Channel 4 uh, report earlier this week. Um, in terms of, well, if I can perhaps address Dundee uh, specifically, first of all, uh, Jenny Mara will be aware, I'm sure, that Dundee Alcohol and Drug Partnership are proposing to hold a, a commission specifically on drug uh, misuse in Dundee to identify best practice and consider issues that will have an impact on drug use, uh, including mental health, deprivation and social inclusion. And I think uh, that move is to be welcomed. More generally, and I know this has been debated widely in the Chamber uh, previously, uh, data indicates that the rise in drug deaths is predominantly being driven by an older cohort of chaotic drug users experiencing multiple uh, comorbidities and we had of course the NHS Health Scotland report last year establishing links between the rise in drug deaths and the legacy of social policies going back to the 1980s but it is absolutely important that we do everything we can now uh, to tackle and address that that's why we take a public health approach to problem drug misuse and we are reviewing our national drug strategy so it's founded on the principles of seek keep and treat. Uh, the nature of Scotland's drug problem has changed uh, and that's one of the reasons we're introducing a combined drug and alcohol treatment strategy. We're also investing significant sums of money to tackle problem drug and alcohol uh, misuse and of course uh, we announced in the budget uh, additional funding uh, for alcohol and drug treatment services. So these are important issues and we must uh, work as hard as we can to tackle them. Uh, if I can end though on uh, I suppose a more positive note that I think should give us encouragement uh, for the future. Latest uh, figures indicate that drug taking in the general population is actually falling and it remains low for young people. So latest figures indicate the number uh, of adults aged 16 to 59 uh, using drugs uh, in the last year has decreased. Now, uh, I'm not saying that should make us complacent, but uh, it does underline the fact that this is an issue uh, about a legacy of older drug users who are now suffering serious health problems, and that must help us target uh, the interventions that we need to take to address that more effectively. Question three, Willie Rennie. I am with the First Minister on her ambition to expand nursery education, but I'm deeply concerned that she's not going to be able to deliver it. I hope she understands when so many organisations have spoken out recently. Look at who is speaking out. We've got fair funding for kids who talk about the lack of flexibility. We've got the Accounts Commission who spoke of a significant risk, a lack of clarity, poor planning and the funding shortfall. You've got the Childminders Association who say that the sector is potentially facing a crisis. Why does the First Minister think all these organisations are wrong? 
Well, that's a, a mischaracterisation of my position and the position of the government. We're working closely with local authorities. We uh, will address fully uh, all of the recommendations of the Audit Scotland report last week. And in fact, childminders will be absolutely central to delivering the expanded uh, provision that we are committed to and that we have already been talking about uh, today. Uh, the lack of flexibility, as, as Willie Rennie describes it, and as I said earlier on, we are seeing increasing flexibility in the current system, but it's actually a recognition that the current system is not flexible enough that has, uh, or, or is one of the things that led us to give the commitment uh, to doubling provision, because it stands to reason if you have whole day provision as a matter of right, then the ability for that to be provided more flexibly uh, increases. So I, I, I readily acknowledge, and, and we did so when we made this commitment, the challenges in delivering such an ambitious policy. But this is one of the uh, many policies, actually, that this government is committed to uh, that has the potential to be genuinely transformational. So we will continue uh, to take the action, put in place the plans, even if they're more detailed than Richard Leonard uh, wants them to be, to make sure that working with our local authority partners, this is a commitment that is delivered, just as our previous commitment was delivered, because it is for the benefit of young people in every part of the country. Willie Rennie. I mean, I want to repeat, I do agree with her ambition. I really want this to work. But if everything is OK, why are so many organisations speaking out? When Fair Funding for Kids warned her in 2015, the First Minister said she'd fix it. In 2016, they warned again. The First Minister simply repeated the same words, and they're back again this year. At the current rate of progress, it will take another 20 years to recruit the staff needed, and it will take 45 years before places are available everywhere during the school holidays. Three years after the First Minister made this promise, why? Why is the government so far behind? First Minister. We, we're not far behind, and I have to say some of the claims that Willie Rennie has just made there are, are ridiculous and, and will be seen to be ridiculous in a, a few years' time when we have delivered this commitment just as we delivered the 600 hours uh, when many people across this chamber were, were sceptical that we would do so. Now, in terms of fair funding for our, our kids, uh, I, I don't want to put words into their mouth and they will speak for themselves, but many of the frustrations they have are about the current system and, and the lack of flexibility. Now, I gave statistics to Richard Leonard about the increase uh, in flexibility that we've seen over the last few years, but that doesn't go far enough. And it's actually the recognition of that that has led to the commitment to double provision. Uh, so we want to uh, increase the provision in the way we've set out. We want to make that provision inherently more uh, flexible. And of course, crucially, which uh, in interestingly, neither Richard Leonard or Willie Rennie have actually raised today, we want to make sure that the provision is of a very high quality because fundamentally, although the benefits to parents are important, Fundamentally, this is about improving the early years experience of our youngest children. So this is uh, one of the key policies of this government. I fully expect to be scrutinised on the delivery as we go through the next few years, but it is one that we are determined to deliver and determined to put the funding and the planning in place to make sure that we can and we do. Some further supplementaries. The first from Ivan McKee. Just eight months ago, the Scottish Tories boasted about championing Scottish interests at Westminster. But now it transpires their MPs take their marching orders from Jacob Rees-Mogg, not Ruth Davidson. How can any Scottish MP justify support for the hardest of hard Brexits to their constituents? Very, very, very briefly. The, the members are entitled to make a point, but it's not massively a question for the First Minister. Well, the First Minister may. Not a for me. The, first, the First Minister may respond briefly, but she will have an opportunity in the next question to respond at length on Brexit. With the greatest of respect, I, I do think Brexit is very much a matter for, for the First That's Minister, true. given the That's risks it poses. The question was about Conservative MSP. Yeah. The question was phrased about Conservative MPs. I don't believe you have responsibility for Conservative MPs. First Minister, you'll have a, a chance to answer this question in a few minutes. We'll move on to the next supplementary. Next supplementary from Jackson Carlaw. Um, at, a, at a recent meeting with the Asian community in my Eastwood constituent... Please be quiet. Let Mr Carlaw speak. At a recent meeting with the Asian community in my Eastwood constituency, Police Scotland confirmed that there has been a sustained series of forensically aware gang-related targeted attacks on Asian households, I understand, in Eastwood and in Eastern Bartonshire. Uh, my constituents make no complaint about the actions of Police Scotland or the efforts they are making, 
But one point Police Scotland did make, and these attacks are taking place between 12 and 6 p.m., fortunately but not exclusively when households have not been occupied, is that there is a reluctance in the part of the public who believe that information they may have will be regarded as either trivial or circumstantial. Will the First Minister join me in assuring people that they are not wasting police time and if we are going to tackle this particular and very pernicious attack on the Asian community, it does require all of the public to give whatever information they have immediately to the police so that they can act on it. First Minister. Yes, I... As Jackson Carlow is, is aware, I, I represent a very large Asian population in my own constituency. I'm very, very well aware uh, of this issue uh, and these attacks, and, and they are uh, attacks targeted on uh, the Asian community. Uh, they are absolutely unacceptable and should be completely condemned by all of us. I know people personally who have been uh, targeted in this way in recent weeks. Uh, so this is a serious issue. It's one uh, that I'll be, uh, on a constituency basis, be raising again uh, with, with Police Scotland, although they work very hard uh, to support the community. Um, Jackson Carlow is right to say that anybody within the community uh, who has concerns uh, should come forward and share those concerns. Uh, the information they give will never be treated as trivial because it's not trivial. Uh, these attacks are pernicious uh, and they must be tackled and I know Police Scotland is determined to do all it can to tackle them and I think all of us should give uh, all of the support we possibly can uh, to a very valued and valuable part of our community uh, as they face uh, attacks on them that are so completely unacceptable. And Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. In 2017, a rare and beautiful young golden eagle was raised in the Scottish borders by the only pair of breeding adults there. He was satellite tagged and last month left home for the first time. Less than a week later, he disappeared in the Pentland Hills near Curry. His tag stopped sending data for three days, then started again, this time in the North Sea off St Andrews. RSPB Scotland and Raptor Persecution UK regard this disappearance as highly suspicious, and I believe it's likely that this young eagle has been illegally killed. Donald Dewar described the persecution of birds of prey as a national disgrace, but it is still going on. What is the Scottish Government doing in response to these reports? And will the First Minister finally commit to a licensing regime for game bird shooting? Thank you. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say I uh, agree that the persecution of birds of prey uh, is unacceptable and would absolutely uh, associate myself with uh, the comments that Alison Johnson has made in that uh, regard. The Government treats this uh, and, and sees this as an extremely serious issue. Uh, there is a group, as Alison Johnson will be aware, uh, that was set up following a report that was commissioned and published uh, last year on this issue, which is looking at uh, various aspects of this, uh, licensing, the impact of grouse shooting uh, on this particular issue. Uh, I'm very happy, and I'm sure Rosanna Cunningham, as the responsible minister, would be very happy to meet with Alison Johnson to discuss this work uh, in more detail, but I'm sure all of us across the chamber are united in agreeing that this is something that is unacceptable and requires to be robustly tackled. Question number four, Marie Goujon. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on negotiations regarding Scotland's place in Europe. First Minister. The Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations uh, was meeting this morning. Um, I understand it uh, broke up just before the session of First Minister's questions started and uh, there will be another meeting uh, next week. Uh, in our discussions with the UK Government, we continue at all times to seek to protect both the devolution settlement and Scotland's place in Europe. Uh, that said, the UK Government still refuses to listen to the case for retaining single market membership, despite the clear evidence, including from the UK Government itself, of the damage that will be caused by a hard Brexit. Decisions on the future relationship with the EU continue to be taken without the proper involvement of all of the governments of the UK. I wrote to the Prime Minister on this very issue on the 6th of February, uh, to which I'm sorry to say I'm yet to receive a response. Mary Gujo. It's the devolution element of that that I'd really like to focus on because a founding principle of devolution is that the powers of this parliament can only be amended with the consent of this parliament. And as the Finance Committee's cross-party report made clear, as it currently stands, the EU withdrawal bill, and I quote, is incompatible with the devolution settlement in Scotland. Now, in the First Minister's view, are the new proposals from the UK government, which would essentially give them a supervisory role over Holyrood, now compatible with devolution? First Minister. Uh, no, I don't think they are. Um, 
I think it's right to recall that uh, there is a unanimous view in this parliament that clause 11 of the withdrawal bill is incompatible with devolution. There has been uh, movement from the UK government and I, I welcome that because I think it's a recognition of how unacceptable uh, the initial proposals uh, were, but that movement doesn't yet go far enough. And I think just to try to simplify this, it doesn't just give the UK government oversight of this parliament in government, it would in matters that are devolved to this parliament effectively give the UK government powers of imposition uh, or powers of veto. Now, I don't think that's acceptable. Uh, the government of Wales doesn't believe that is acceptable and that's why there must be further movement from the UK government if we are going to reach agreement. And I hope we can reach agreement. Uh, we, I think, are being asked uh, by the UK government to take it on trust that they will not exercise these powers in a way uh, that are unacceptable but you know and I, I don't want to and I am not casting aspersions on the good faith of any individual uh, but we shouldn't forget that this is a, a UK government right now that at times seems willing to ride roughshod over the Northern Irish Good Friday Agreement and I don't think we can simply take it and trust that the same government would always respect the devolution settlement that's why we must have guarantees that this parliament uh, the powers of this parliament and the devolution settlement must be protected and no Scottish government worth its salt would accept anything less. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Can the First Minister respond to the SRUC report out this week? It said this about leaving the EU. In every scenario, Scotland's farmers would be worse off compared to under the current trade arrangement with some or all producers facing lower returns. First Minister. Well, there's absolutely no doubt that Brexit will have a significant impact on the day-to-day -day running of every farm and every croft across the country. Uh, and this important study reaffirms what previous studies have shown, uh, such as those carried out by the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute and Quality Meat Scotland. Uh, so this report is yet further confirmation that the Scottish Government position of remaining in the EU or failing that staying within the single market and customs union would be in the best interests, uh, not just of Scotland, but the whole of the UK. And it's why it does really beggar belief that this week we have seen uh, a third of the Scottish Tory MPs sign up to a letter effectively calling for the hardest possible no deal Brexit. It is absolutely shameful because it is against the interests of the country they're supposed to represent. Question number five, Michelle Ballantyne. To, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent Sco Audit Scotland report, which states that its childcare plans face significant challenges. First Minister. Our commitment to uh, double free nursery education is the most ambitious expansion of funded early learning and childcare uh, that this country has ever seen, providing all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds uh, with 1140 hours of nursery education will ensure that children get the best possible start in life while also supporting parents and families into work training and education. Uh, we will of course uh, carefully consider the recommendations in the Audit Scotland report and address the issues it raises, but we remain on track to deliver our expansion plans and uh, I I welcome Audit Scotland's recognition of our uh, good working relationship with local authorities and other partners to deliver our shared objective uh, and I'm assured that we will reach agreement with COSLA on a multi-year funding package by the end of April. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. As the First Minister indicated earlier, the quality of childcare provision depends on the quality and availability of good staff. The Scottish Government has estimated that they need between 6,000 and 8,000 additional whole-time equivalent staff to de deliver the planned expansion, and presumably the Government's funding estimates are based on this. Audit Scotland's report, however, reveals that the Council estimates place the number significantly higher, with an additional 12,000 staff required. Can the First Minister please tell me which figure she believes is correct? First Minister. The figures that the Scottish Government has put forward are the ones uh, that, that we believe uh, are required and as I said to Richard Leonard uh, earlier on uh, we have a plan, a very detailed plan in place to recruit the additional staff uh, that are required uh, for this policy and of course we will continue on an ongoing basis to discuss these issues uh, with COSLA and you know what I, I think we, we mustn't miss in this is the massive opportunity uh, that is involved in this policy. Uh, as I've said earlier on, it is about improving the early years experience of children, which will help them in terms of attainment later on in school. It's about making it easier for parents to get into work. 
but it is also a massive opportunity uh, for greater availability of jobs in this sector, uh, not just for young people, but for particularly uh, for young people. So every aspect of this policy, uh, I think, is positive. Yes, challenges are inherent in it because of the ambitious nature and scale of it, but we will continue to work, as we have been doing, to make sure that just like the last uh, commitment we gave, it will be delivered and it will be delivered in full. And question number six, Monica Lennon. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator is aware of multiple allegations of abusive behaviour and misconduct in the third sector. First Minister. Well, like everyone, I uh, am appalled to hear reports of abuse and misconduct uh, by staff in the third sector. Um, I am very clear that the Scottish Government will not tolerate human rights abuses uh, whatever they take place. We expect all organisations to monitor their work closely and any reported incident must be dealt with firmly and thoroughly. Oscar's regulatory focus is to ensure that charity trustees are dealing appropriately with any allegations of misconduct and other serious incidents affecting their charity uh, where complaints have been made uh, to Oscar. I'm assured that the trustees have acted promptly in line with their legal responsibilities and that safeguarding policies have been uh, put in place. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her reply. Scotland's charity sector plays an important role in creating a fairer Scotland and we are all grateful to them for the work that they do. Recent reports about sexual misconduct in Scottish charities is worrying. There is no legal requirement for charities to report notifiable events to Oscar. So it is left open to charities to decide whether an event merits reporting. Since 2016, 8% of all cases notified to Oscar related to sexual misconduct. We know that stigma and poor understanding of legal rights stops victims from reporting sexual harm. And coupled with charities applying discretion to what they tell Oscar, the true scale of sexual misconduct in the charity sector could be higher. What steps will the First Minister consider taking to ensure that the current charity regulations and Oscar procedures are robust and fit for purpose? And can she update the Parliament on other steps the government is taking to speed up uh, a change in, in, in culture to ensure that sexual harassment and sexual assaults are not played down and are not uh, rooted in, in victim blaming. First Minister. Well, in, in terms of the first part of the member's question, we will you know, continue to discuss with Oscar um, and listen to any views they have uh, about any changes they consider uh, are necessary to the procedures in place. But as I said, they already have a regulatory focus to ensure that charity trustees are dealing appropriately with any allegations of uh, misconduct. Um, I think the second point I would made, make is one that Monica Lennon uh, alluded to, is that notwithstanding these uh, quite horrendous uh, revelations that we've been reading about and hearing about in recent weeks, we must remember the good work that our charity sector does. Uh, there are literally thousands of people, many of them volunteers, the length and breadth of the country contributing their time and efforts to help make this country a better place. I was very proud uh, yesterday, as I was last year, to officially open the SCVO gathering in, in Glasgow. That's an opportunity to recognise the efforts of our charities and third sector uh, generally. Uh, and finally, on the more general point, all of us have an obligation in this regard. Uh, we, you know, at the moment, uh, one week we're uh, facing allegations in politics or Hollywood. Uh, more recently, it's been uh, the charity sector. Uh, but underlying all of this is not a particular sector uh, or a particular organisation. It is the fact that we have a culture in our society where some men, and I stress some men, still abuse positions of power uh, that they hold. That is what is unacceptable. These things are not easy for any of us, but all of us have a duty to stand up and do the right things to make sure that that culture, that fundamental underlying culture, is one that we're challenging and changing for good. L Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister, uh, in the light of recent reports, if she agrees that whilst children die for lack of food and whilst women, men and children across the world are disadvantaged in ways that we cannot begin to imagine, uh, that we cannot allow the appalling behaviour of the few to jeopardise the aid commitment to those who need it most. First Minister. Absolutely. I hope that that's something every single member uh, of this chamber would unite behind. Uh, we should never condone uh, or diminish uh, individual cases like the ones we've heard of. 
but our charity sector generally and our international aid sector in particular do valued and valuable and vital work and we must support them in doing that. You know, we all know that there are some politicians, hopefully not in this chamber, but perhaps in uh, other parts of the UK that would uh, use these revelations to undermine the very commitment to international aid that we are proud of. We must not allow that to happen. We have a duty to help the most vulnerable and poorest across the world and I want to see us continue to do that. Thank you very much and that concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on to members' business in the name of Graham Day. We'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats.